Before we get started, I just wanted to prepare you a little bit for some of the audio quality issues uh, that we had with this recording. Due to an unfortunate set of events, uh, Matthew ended up having to uh, record this episode from a Starbucks um, in Shanghai. And I think that you will agree that, you know, given those set of circumstances, his audio quality was actually quite good. However, what that does mean is that there is a bit of uh, background noise and a bit of background music. Um, it's not that big of a deal, but I just wanted to prepare you guys in case um, you're kind of wondering where some of that uh, that smooth jazz is coming from when when he's speaking. But other than that, let's just jump right into it. Welcome to China Tech Talk, a weekly discussion of technology and startups here in China. I'm John Artman, Editor-in-Chief of TechNote, and as always, I'm joined by Matthew Brennan, founder of China Channel. This week, we're going to be looking at Apple in China. There's been a lot of ink spilled recently um, about uh, what is ac- exactly is going on with them here in China, in particular, because if you look at their their Q1 results, you know this got a lot of a lot of headlines, and everyone's been talking about it because it's one of the biggest declines that they've had here in the market. And um, why are we talking about this now, in particular? One of the reasons is because uh, Matthew over at China Channel is actually Right in the middle of、um, of putting together a report about Apple in China, and so we're going to talk a little bit about his report and、uh, go into a little bit more depth about what exactly.、Um, Is happening with this with this huge huge company、um, that seems to be going a little bit like、uh, other foreign companies here in China,、uh, <laughs> not so well.、Um, so so Matthew, so you know, give us give us a bit of a sense, you know, from from the data that that you've seen so far. I mean, how is Apple doing in China right now? Broadly speaking, we can say Apple is not doing so well in China, and I think a lot of people have been saying that recently.、Um, but we just wanted to go deep. And really look at the numbers, and we did a lot of research to find out what we feel are the best publicly available statistics in this area、um, across hardware,、um, across the services ecosystem, and really break down and get some analysis there of what's going on. And it's very, very interesting.、Um, Apple, broadly speaking,、um, is in a much, much more vulnerable position than most people realise in China. I think vulnerable is the key word. Um, you know, they still have a good brand in China for sure.、Um, they're still perceived as a luxury brand. A lot of people love Apple in China.、Uh, there's a lot of people using Apple products here,、um, but there's warning signs. There's quite a lot of warning signs、uh, from the performance of local manufacturers,、um, how they're doing their their marketing here, and the progress they're making. And then there's a lot of、uh, bad signals in terms of their ecosystem here for services, which is extremely weak. Um, and when we compare that with the states,、um, that's it's, it's a very very clear difference there. Users, we can say broadly speaking that in China,、um, an, an iPhone is 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 just another luxury phone.、Um, it's quite different from in the states. Whereas when I speak to people in the states and ask them, you know, would you, you're an iPhone user, could you possibly think about using an Android device? And everyone says no, absolutely not. I could never. That would be unthinkable. You know, I'm locked into all of these um, products um,、uh, and iOS.、Uh, the idea of moving to an Android phone for for an American iPhone user is uh, is quite uh, quite a scary prospect. Now in China,、um, the it's it's a very very different picture. Moving from Um, Apple to、uh, using a Huawei phone, for example, a local phone, a local、uh, locally produced Android phone, is much much easier. And、um, as we know, Chinese consumers are notoriously unloyal、um, and fickle. They love new things, and it could actually be a case. I feel we're at a tipping point now because Apple is on the verge of, you know, later this year they're due to release、um, a new iPhone, which is lots of rumours about that that it's going to be a game-changing product.、Uh, so we'll have to see. We have to see how things play out. I mean, if that is a really a game-changing product, okay, then Apple could be could be on a, a big ups upswing here. 
Um, but if uh, I have my doubts over whether a, a, just a, a, how far we can go with just another iPhone, and uh, if it turns out to be a bit of a disappointing release, um, yeah, we could see some very interesting things happening in the Chinese market. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. And so you know, kind of looking looking back a little bit. Um, to you know Apple's Apple's uh, performance in 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 previous years, I think it's it's really important to point out that you know a lot of the momentum that Apple has had in China is in part due to a few different things, um, and I think obviously you know the first one is going to be first mover advantage. You know they were the first uh, smartphone. Um, I remember being here in China. I moved to China in two thousand and eight. Um, my, um, my, my, my wife, well, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, you know, she had this, uh, this, this really advanced kind of Nokia phone, uh, one of the last, like really, uh, well-performing Nokia phones. And that was at a, at a time just before Apple came out. Um, and as soon as Apple, uh, released the iPhone, um, and, and the thing is in, in China, the iPhone was not available for quite some time to actually be purchased here in China. And so what what they were able to do is in some ways because the because of scarcity it became a very a highly desired brand and a highly desired good to have. Even up to, you know, the the iPhone 3G and the iPhone 3GS, um it was actually difficult to um get the phone after release. Um and in fact, it wasn't until the iPhone 4 that Apple had come to an understanding with the Chinese government about getting everything approved beforehand, before the launch announcement, um, so that when it was time to launch, they were almost immediately available in China. And, you know, now with the upcoming um, iPhone 8 or iPhone 7S, whatever it's going to be, you know, more than likely it's going to be if there is any lag between the the um, the announcement and the actual availability in the store, it's going to be, you know, a week, two weeks at the most, whereas before it was months. And so I think, you know, the, so the first mover advantage um, was obviously there. You know, they were able to create um, a, a highly desired product and just because it was new, um, but also because, you know, at the time, smartphones were a status symbol. Um, and so, you know, that that Nokia phone that um, that my wife had at the time, you know, that was something that um, her parents gave to her, actually, uh, because, you know, they wanted her to have something nice. They wanted her to have something that acted a bit as a as a status symbol. Um, and that's that's just kind of how how they think and how, how a lot of Chinese people think. And so when the first iPhone came out, not only was it scarce, but it was also quite expensive. Uh, and so the the combination of the scarcity and the cost uh, really kind of pushed the status of the iPhone up to, you know, the same level as like Gucci or Prada or LV, um, where, you know, if you are looking to be known, if you are looking to show off your status here in China, those are some of the brands that you're going to be going for. And the iPhone um, has really been part of that. Um, you know, as as Samsung, you know, started to introduce um, their phones and the price of their phones was comparable in some ways to the iPhone, um, these types of phones did end up in a certain sense um, being, um, you know, having a similar status effect um, as as the iPhone. Uh, but at the same time, the iPhone has historically just just been um, very, um, very much, you know, that just just very, very strong. I have an iPhone, which means that I have a lot of money, you know, because one of the big differences between uh, the US, for example, and in China is that the iPhone in China has never had contracts. You know, you can't go to China Unicom and say, okay, I'm going to give you, you know, 2000 renminbi for the iPhone and a, and a two year contract. Instead, you know, if you want, if you want pretty much any phone, you have to fork out in cash on the table, the full price of the phone. Um, and so we're talking in China anywhere between like 5,000 to, to 7,000 RMB, um, you know, roughly um, between a little bit less than $1,000 and a little bit more uh, than than $1,000. So again, a status symbol. But I think, you know, when, we, when we're looking at what's happening um, in China right now, and, and in certain senses uh, around the world, um, you know, it's becoming less of a status symbol, um, where it's still that... People who have the money, who have the disposable income, they 
are willing to spend that money. Uh, more than likely, they have more than one Apple product. They have an iPhone, an iPad, a Mac. Um, you know, they, they fit the typical user profile of a lot of um, um, Apple fans. Um, but, you know, as the smartphone market gets bigger, as more people are coming into the smartphone market, that's one of the big reasons, I think, that their market share is declining. Um, and, and, and really, you know, as, as we're going to talk about, you know, when, when you're looking at their defensibility, whereas what they have in China with their ecosystem or, the, or they have in other areas with their ecosystem and their services, they don't have that in China uh, at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that. And also, there, um, an extra point is that the perception of the Apple brand is changing. And um, we actually delved deep into finding some, um, some examples of that um, on, on sort of Chinese forums, uh, Chinese influencers in the tech scene, and what they're saying about Apple now. Um, and that does lead into this sort of hoo-ha recently about the tip jar feature and tipping. Um, so a lot of people have been writing about the fact that Apple has clamped down in China on um, virtual virtual tipping in, in a, across a variety of apps and insisting that that goes through their in-phone uh, system where they can take 30%. So there's been quite a backlash um, in the tech community in China against Apple and them taking this, this very large cut actually 30 percent um, in China for a, no Chinese company would come would, would ev even consider taking such a large chunk um, of, of, uh, of payments um, you know for payments on, on WeChat pay or Alipay for example you know they're typically taking 0.6 percent from businesses when they make transactions on their platforms um, 30 percent is uh, an enormous sum for, for, for China and yeah, there's definitely a, a backlash against what they're doing and a lot of questioning over Apple. A lot of questioning over is Apple, um, you know, cool anymore? Um, the Chinese consumers, as we mentioned earlier, they're quite fickle. Uh, they love the, uh, the for, for local brands, they'll be releasing new products, uh, new phones on a much more um, shorter time scale, their, their, their turnover in terms of new models. So there's always something new going on with these local brands. And um, their marketing is also very, very locally adapted. Um, Apple's marketing is good. Um, don't get me wrong. It's um, you know they have they have their way of marketing Apple, which is very, very strong globally. Um, but marketing in China is often quite different, and um, a lot of it's based around things like slogans. Um, a lot of it's based around meeting local market needs and preferences. And Apple hasn't really localized in, in, in their marketing very, very well. Well, even, uh, the, even then, I mean, I think that, um, you know, a lot of marketing in China is also celebrities, which Apple has not done uh, as far as I've seen. Exactly, exactly. So there's a, there's a variety of reasons here. And um, that means that they're on the, just on the marketing level, their brand, I think, is the perception of their brand is changing it's changing fast and not not for the good yeah and that's that's the thing i think i think you know you you, you gave me a um a, a sneak peek at some of the report and, and i think that one of the big things that i was most surprised by was um the number of people um not necessarily defecting from the iphone because that's not so surprising but the number of people defecting from the iphone to Huawei in, in, in particular, I think, because a lot of a lot of the press um, over there, you know, since since the beginning of this year has been about Oppo and, and Vivo in, in uh, particular, um, you know, capturing a lot of a lot of market share, um, which is definitely true. But at the same time, it seems that, you know, that the in terms of um, Apple losing market share, they're losing market share mostly to to Huawei. But but why why do you think that is? I mean, I have some speculation myself, but I'm curious to hear to hear what you ha have to say about that first. Yeah. Um, okay. So, really interesting. So, I often look to my wife's family as a bellwether of, of the Chinese consumer because um, I'm, you know, I'm married to a, a, a Chinese uh, lady, and she's um, she's very typical. Her family is very typical of a sort of tier two. Uh, you know, they're from Chengdu, Sichuan area. This is not tier one. It's very much a 
um, I think I think they're very good representatives of, of the sort of general Chinese consumer. And so I don't I, I often use them to, to decide how things are going. Um, they're, you know, religious iPhone users, a lot of them. Uh, and now recently, as a part of this report, I sort of asked them about their their opinions of, of Apple. And these are not tech people. These these are not. These are just very, very uh, like normal um, like tier two people. And um, yeah, my brother-in-law now is not using iPhone. And he actually said to me, oh, you know, I use Huawei. It's better. They're more expensive. And uh, I didn't, you know, those were his words. I didn't uh, like force him to, uh, uh, I didn't prompt him to say, but I. So just, 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 just to go back for that for a second. So he said that Huawei is expensive. Therefore, it's good. That's why I switched. Well, obviously, there's a lot more to it than that. But okay. that was his explanation of. Um, why he doesn't use iPhone anymore? He said they're more Huawei is more expensive and it's better. Um, so you know, the perception often abroad of, of Chinese phone manufacturers can be uh, you know the, the poster child traditionally has been Xiaomi, right? So Xiaomi has had a, this amazing sort of roller coaster ride with a huge growth and now they're starting to fall. But Xiaomi is all about price, right? They 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 really 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 cheap phones at really really good quality um, uh, i'm not so i'm not so sure about the quality claim but uh, maybe we can talk about okay, that in well, a second quality well for, for that price well i use xiaomi right <laughs> okay xiaomi that uh, actually uh yeah i would also question that to be honest, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. but uh, uh you know i'm currently a xiaomi user i have been for about half a year now okay so um, yeah that, that i mean the the Xiaomi actually is not a good representation of what's going on here. I think Huawei, is a, Huawei and Oppo are the two brands to watch in mm. this area. And the data sort of supports that um, in terms of the market share and the trend on, on their market share in China. Those are the two guys that currently seem to be uh, taking off. And um, it's not about price competition. These guys are, uh, Huawei in particular has, has lots of phones that are very expensive, um, like high-end uh, high stuff. Um, there's a variety of factors here. Yeah. Um, if we if we look at Oppo, for example, their marketing's fantastic. Yeah. Um, they're really really good. They've got this phrase about um, you know charge your phone for uh, five minutes and get two hours of talk time. Uh, make a call for two hours. Now that doesn't sound like a great marketing phrase in English, um, but in Chinese um, it sounds a lot lot better. And it's actually got to a stage where that phrase. Um, is so popular and so well known in China that people actually go into phone stores and say, hey, um, I want that phone, the one where you charge it for like uh, five minutes and you get two hours talk time. What is it, what is it in Chinese? In Chinese, it's like uh, shan, shan, shan chong or something like that, right? Yeah, hang on. I can, I can find the Chinese. It's in the report, actually. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's got to a stage where people are asking, you know, Oh, I want that phone that does that. That charges really fast, but they don't even know what it is. They, but they know the phrase. They know the marketing phrase. Mm. And Oppo's got so many stores across China. They're really known as sort of the kings of what we call in China D Tway. D Tway is a, a sort of ground promotion. It's like getting people on the ground. It's um, uh, a very sort of like labor-intensive way of promoting. Um, mm. Doing lots of events outside, having lots and lots of salespeople. Uh, their commission scheme is very, very good. Um, they highly incentivize their sales staff. Um, and yeah, they've got over 200,000 distribution stores now in China. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. So I, mean, I want to take a, take a step back and kind of unpack some of the things that um, that you just said uh, in particular about about uh, Oppo. Um, and starting starting with the um, with the the charging feature, I think that this is this is actually really key. Uh, because you know, if you look around, even in Beijing, so Beijing is a tier one city, um, so that means there's there's quite a few there's quite a few affluent people, uh, but there's also quite a few middle class and and and, and lower as as well, migrant workers, uh, people who do you know kind of uh, low skilled labor and, and and things like that, delivery people, construction workers, and so on and so on, um, and the, and the thing is. You know, if you look at um, user habits, uh, power banks have become really super, super popular uh, in yeah. particular because, you know, I mean, the, the phones inside of a battery just do not hold a charge for very, excuse me, the, the, the batteries inside of a phone 
do not just do not hold a charge for for very long. Um, if you're using it to um, play games, you know MMO RPGs and 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 MOBAs and things like that are super super popular here in China, uh, all on the phone. And so you know that's that's very battery intensive. Um, but then also you know just things like you know being on WeChat and making making calls and and things like that and reading the news. Um, this all of this sucks up a lot of battery. But the thing is, there's not all always that much opportunity for people to charge their phone uh, because if you're if you're a construction worker, if you're um, someone who's doing you know low skilled labor, you're out and you're 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 going to be you know doing your thing outside. Um, with very few opportunities to hook hook your phone up to um, to an outlet, and so obviously uh, power power banks have become super popular because of that. Um, but then also that's that's one of the big reasons why this type of um, this type of uh, feature I think is super important for the for so many Chinese users because uh, they're just not going to have the time to sit down and plug their phone in for an hour, let's say, for it for it to charge. And so having having that, being able to plug it in for five minutes, you know, maybe uh, maybe you're you're at uh, the local canteen and you can plug it in somewhere, um, or maybe you know someone has a power bank that, that that you can use for for five minutes. You can plug it in and you can keep going for the next two or, two or three hours until you're you're able to charge it uh, for five for five minutes um, again. Um, and so I think that is you know one case of a Chinese company. Um, just understanding their customer very, very well, um, and and really kind of doing their research on what the Chinese customer uh, wants and what the Chinese customer needs. And so you compare that to the iPhone. Also, not only does the iPhone not have that feature, but the iPhone is um, actually you know the battery life on the iPhone isn't that great. Uh, especially compared to, to to Huawei or or Oppo. So not even without that feature, the the battery life on. So I have I have a six S and I'm always charging it basically. Um, so and and you know someone was telling someone a friend of mine was telling me he has a he has a Huawei I think it may be like a like a P nine or something like that. But I mean he he can go you know you know three almost half of a day. Uh, without without having to charge it, and he's on he's on WeChat all the time, and WeChat's a huge a huge power suck. Um, but also, um, one of the things that you mentioned about about distribution, I think that this is also really really interesting because what they're doing is they are using kind of the typical Chinese model of having lots of brick and mortar stores and and relying on you know second uh, third third party. Uh, distributors in order to get their product into people's hands. And I think that's that, that's something that maybe a lot of people outside of China don't realize is that this is how you know products have been sold for you know for forever since since reform and opening since products were since since there was like sales networks um, a lot almost every single product that you can think of um, whether it's a washing machine whether it's a, a, a smartphone whether it's a car it's all through these distribution networks these sales and distribution networks um, which in some ways is causing um, some some problems in in certain areas um, but 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 really I mean if you look at you know on the ground you know as you say Dway um, this is you know what works if you want to have a lot of a lot of reach in China for physical goods yeah they are the kings of Dway that's what every <laughs> that's what everyone says um, and it's so true if you're on the ground you'll see if there's gonna be an event in a supermarket or a, in a, um, a shopping mall for, for phones Oppo's definitely gonna be there yeah, their green logo. You're going to see that a lot. I remember seeing uh, when I lived in Chongqing for four years. Oh my God, they were doing crazy promotions every week all around that square where our office was. Well, and that's um, and that's the thing because I mean, like you don't you know, you know like you and I can can kind of describe it a little bit, but I think unless you see it, you don't quite understand what it is. I mean, it's like you know this kind of um, ad hoc stage with a with a big banner, maybe and maybe a table, probably one or two. Um, you know, young women dressed in skirts or something like that with these um, like these chin microphones um, and like they're they're just like selling the product. Um, I mean, it could be so many different ways, but maybe like they're doing some type of uh, raffle. Maybe they're uh, maybe they're doing some type of karaoke, um, but a lot of different things in order just to grab attention and get people to come to that to that table. Well, people sell, right? And uh, a lot of these consumers buying the phones in uh, in, in uh, lower tier cities, 
they're not very sophisticated consumers. They want to talk to someone when they're buying a phone and they've got a couple of questions. And for Oppo, you know, all they need to say is, well, you can charge this phone in five minutes and it works for two hours. And um, the other thing that they're going for is um, the camera. So the camera on uh, Oppo phones is, is really good on some of them. And they market it as, as the best camera for taking selfies. So for a lot of women, that means immediately the Oppo phone is extremely attractive. Um, I found the, uh, the phrase that they use actually is called a chong dian wu fen zhong tong hua liang xiao shi. Um, that's the okay. one that's super popular in China. So that's the one that they use to promote the um, the uh, like super fast charging. And this is this is one of those this is one of those good examples of the differences between Chinese and Western culture. Because like for us, for me, you know, it's it's basically just telling you the feature. You know, you charge for five minutes, you can use it for two hours. But in China, that works. Yeah, Chinese love numbers, right? So often they're just easy to remember number numbers. So. Um, the five, you know, five minutes, two hours, um, in these kind of, this is the way you need to market stuff, put numbers in there and people can remember it easily. Um, and so, yeah, they've, they're, they're, they're doing a very, very different um, way to Apple. Uh, they're spending a lot of money on getting, uh, as you say, celebrities. You mentioned before, John, celebrities, super important, celebrity endorsements, uh, throwing massive budget behind that. Um, so a combination of these factors is uh, is leading to a situation where they're really gaining a lot of market share, and these are not low end, you know, low budget phones. These are actually quite decent phones, and um, yeah, you can see in the numbers how they are they are really taking market share now from 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 Apple. Going back to to Huawei for a moment. Um, it's actually really interesting because um, Huawei is almost having the exact same problem as Apple in a sense, where they're getting stronger domestically, but internationally they're they're they they've really kind of hit a plateau in terms of smartphone sales. Um, and and the thing is they've um, they actually hired an ex Apple uh, UI designer um, who left earlier this year. Um, to come and you know help them redo their user interface, in particular because they were, um, I mean the the UI for a Huawei phone looks strikingly similar to that of uh, an iPhone, um, and mm. and but and, but the problem is is as they're going internationally, so you have that UI problem. It looks very similar to an iPhone, but then also you know it's their development team is looking at the China market and designing um, features for the China market and that's that's great and that's one of the big reasons that 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 people are switching from from Apple to to Huawei because as you say you know it's it's expensive it works well and it has the features that Chinese people want but on the other hand you know these features you know as as a westerner myself you know looking at these features I'm like I don't need I don't understand what why 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 do I need you know another beautifying app why do I have like this weird uh, music feature um, and, all, and all sorts of different things, um, but but for for Chinese people, that's exactly what they want. Yeah, I think as the ecosystems diverge, so China, in China, everything is so different in terms of the digital um, world. Uh, we don't have Facebook, we don't have Google's not got a strong presence here. All these local competitors have popped up. Um, and so there's really a very, very different world here. And if your product is an international product. So Apple's in a situation where, which most international companies are facing actually, where they have a, a, a product that works really well globally, but now you're going into a different world here in China. And if you don't localize, if you don't put significant effort into tailoring your product to what is a, um, you know, consumers who have very, very different uh, things that they, they care about, you're definitely going to get killed by the local competition. Um, and the local competition here is they're not only tailoring it to, to, the, to the local needs, but they also move extremely fast. So when we look at what's happened with Apple Pay, for example, I think that's a classic example of how Apple has a system which works pretty well globally. I think actually probably is gaining a lot of traction globally, and they're probably quite happy, genuinely quite happy with how it's doing. Uh, on, on an international level. But here in China, it's completely failed. 
and uh, already the local competitors have uh, leapfrogged it and are, are, are using a different system, a simpler system, a system that's based around QR codes, which is not as safe as, as the Apple system, it has lots of disadvantages over it, but they've been able to market it much more effectively and it, it actually meets the needs of like small mum and pup stars who want to do mobile payments but don't want to invest in equipment. And, um, and so now Apple's in a situation where even though they partnered with a very strong partner, they partnered with UnionPay, who has been backed by all the major banks in China. And when it was launched last year, uh, people were speculating that they could take some decent market share. They've been completely you know, wiped the floor with, with in terms of uh, Alipay and, and WeChat Pay. The, the, there's no chance that Apple Pay is going to gain any traction in China now. Yeah, it's 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 really um, it's really interesting to see, um, and I think it, and basically you know when we're looking at Apple Pay, I think you know or or at least you know when we're looking at the success of WeChat Pay and and Alipay, I think part of it has just been accessibility, where they've made a system where, in some ways, as you say, because it's a little bit less secure, it's also easier to implement. Uh, so, um, like with WeChat Pay, for example, and with Alipay, you know, you can make person-to-person transactions where, um, you know, for exa- a, a really great example is uh, street food. So, in China, in, in pretty much any city, where and in, in, in particular where there are um, higher amounts of, um, of um, rush hour foot traffic, so for example, people getting off the subway transferring to a bus, uh, people getting off a bus transferring to a subway, or or at any point during that, um, there are going to be uh, people with these um, stalls, um, or, or, you know, mobile stalls, if you will, um, that, that, that are selling uh, food products. Um, and there's, there's a, there's a wide variety of food products in it, but it ends up being kind of the same no matter, no matter where you go. Um, but you know, these people there the, before the internet, before smartphones, I mean, their entire business was a cash business. Um, and it's actually kind of funny because even credit cards in China are fairly new and credit cards really didn't start getting a, getting a wider rates of adoption until maybe like, you know, one or two years before WeChat Pay and Alipay really, uh, really hit the ground. Um, so, so you have these people who, um, you know, they have no access to credit card uh, transactions. Uh, they don't have, you know, a point of sale machine. Uh, and, and why would they? I mean, they're dealing with, you know, uh, two renminbi, five renminbi, 10 renminbi transactions. Uh, and so instead, and now instead of cash, they have their own QR code that, you know, with Alipay or with, uh, with WeChat, I can scan and make a person-to-person transaction. Uh, and so rather than um, having, you know, a credit card uh, clear the transaction and, 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 and charging a processing fee, it's the, 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 the experience is almost exactly the same as a cash transaction, except that mm-hmm. it's, it's, all, it's all, through the, all through the smartphone. Um, and I think that's that's the been the real um, weakness in a sense for Apple Pay. You know, the 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 only time that I ever used. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna take a step back. So the, the interesting thing about Apple Pay is that when it when it was finally released in China, the adoption rate was was astonishing. Um, I think I think that you have that um, in your report, um, and I'm probably gonna mess it up now. But it's like three million signups in like the first the first week or something like that. So I mean, like the oh, yeah. Yeah. the interest. So, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, it's great. In the report, I didn't even pay attention to it when it was launched. But in the report, yeah, we found the quotes from when it was actually launched in, back in February last year, and uh, the. The uh, vice president of Apple Pay said, "Oh, you know, if we if we we give ourselves a thousand out of a hundred, if the full score is a hundred, <laughs> then we get a thousand for the first day because we just killed it. It was so amazing." Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it seems very laughable now. But that, that's but that's it. but that's the thing. And so there was there was a huge amount of interest in it. Uh, it was very very clear for me. Like I was like I kept um, you know just waiting because it was launched, but then it was a progressive rollout. So not not all users um, were able to get it at the same time. And so it wasn't until like maybe um, you know later in the day that it was available for me. And of course, like I signed up immediately because I'm like yeah, yeah heck yeah. Um, but the thing is, the only time I ever actually used it was at Starbucks. And and the reason yeah. is, is because Starbucks, up until recently, the only transactions you can make were either cash, credit card, or Apple Pay. 
Um, and, you know, I'm at the point where I don't really carry much cash with me anymore. So I'm going to, um, you know, either use my credit card or, or use Apple Pay. But now they take WeChat. So there's absolutely no point. There's pretty much no reason for me at, at any time to use Apple Pay for, all, for, for any transaction. Well, this is it. I mean, it's a typical case where Apple has partnered with um, another American organization. Uh, they, you know, at, Starbucks is actually very strong in China. They're doing really, really well, as far as I can tell. Um, but um, so they've, they've used them as a, as a, as a part, an exclusive partner. And as of, you know, at the very end of last year, now that even Starbucks has switched over uh, to, to, to WeChat Pay. And so that is, yeah, a very much a, a sort of slap in the face to, to, to Apple Pay. But to be honest, the, the, the writing was on the wall. For anyone who was on the ground, it was obvious what was happening. Uh, pretty quickly. Um, Apple Pay just was dead in the water pretty much. Well, it's, it's, I think the equipment is the, is, is the big one that just kills it in the water. I mean, China, nobody's going to invest. None of these uh, small and medium-sized businesses are going to invest in that. Um, they're very sensitive on that stuff. And uh, buying equipment is, is, is just is immediately, yeah, I mean, it's not. It's not going to work. So the the uh, there's, that's one of the factors, and then the local competitors, WeChat, uh, you know, as an example, peer-to-peer -peer transactions. There's almost zero friction on that, and it's free. And and then you've got things like Lucky Money, the the sort of very culturally specific campaigns that they're doing, which have been incredibly successful. Um, and then comparing that to what Apple's doing, it makes it it's laughable. It's laughable. Um, they're, 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 there's no way they can compete with that. No way. So, um, yeah, it, although Apple is, you know, an extremely strong company and they have a massive, massive resources, um, I think this is such a great case study because Apple, you would think if anyone could crack China, Apple could. And the data, you know, the numbers that were coming out a few years ago on what Apple was doing in China were really impressive. Um, if you go back to the, the beginning of the report, you know, the growth in China was humongous in, in like 2012, 2013. Um, it was growing much faster um, than, I'm sorry, 2015 in particular. 2015, China was, uh, Apple was growing incredibly in China, you know, over 100% growth. Now we've, we're in a situation where this, this roller coaster is, 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 has dived and um, the local players have caught up. And Apple has clearly been unable to localize their product uh, here, unwilling or unable, perhaps a bit of both. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's it's coming back to bite them. Well, exactly, really exactly. And that's the thing. It's not just it's not just payments. Um, it's almost every single service. I mean, you look at iMessenger, and um, and even in the U.S., I think iMessenger is it, it, it's, it's basically um, useless at this point in a, in a lot of ways. People still use it, um, but you know, um, with I mean, what's the point of using iMessenger when I can use when I can use WeChat? Um, what's the point of using um, iCloud um, when I can use, you know, Baidu Cloud for 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 cheaper? Uh, what's the point of using Apple Music when you know there's so many free services uh, available yeah. in in China? I mean, some some of them they do have, you know, um, special uh, membership um, uh, packages that 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 you can buy, but they're much cheaper. Um, than than um, uh, than I, than music on Apple, um, and then you know I mean and and then content I mean like oh my god so we were we were talking about this before we started recording but you know I remember when iTunes movies first became available um, and I'm I'm a pretty big Apple fan I'm 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 pretty invested in the ecosystem already um, so when that was available I noticed that um, Star Wars episodes I mean all the episodes one two three four five six was available. Um, you know, we have four, five, and six on DVD and, and Blu-ray already, but we don't have one, two, and three. So I said, you know what, why not? I'll just go ahead and, and purchase all, all three of these. Um, and it wasn't too expensive. Um, it was, it was a reasonable price and I can't remember exactly how much. Um, but then I think like, you know, I was, I wasn't really paying attention. Um, I had watched maybe like one of them, maybe one and a half of them. And then like two months later, I go back to iTunes and there's no movies. There's no movies at all. And I had paid, I had paid, you know, 
my money for this. Um, Apple at, at no point, you know, sent me like a system message saying, hey, you know, we have to, uh, we're, 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 we're taking down our, our movies uh, offering. Um, at, at no point did they say that. At no point did they offer any types of refunds or anything like that. And so, you know, I'm in the hole for, the, for these three movies that I paid money for that I have no access to whatsoever. Um, and so, and, and then, and then the same cases with iBooks. I mean, iBooks in China on the Chinese market is basically non-existent. Um, and you know, in on the U.S. on the U.S. Uh, markets, uh, Canadian, pretty much anything that's not Chinese, um, it's actually fairly robust. I mean, you can buy audiobooks, you can buy the the some of the latest books that that just got published. But in China, it's basically like if I want to buy an English language book. It's it's the classics. It's the like things that are not actually like under copyright or trademark any any anymore. And even then, I mean, you know, you go into iBooks and even the Chinese, the Chinese offerings are are very minimal a, a, as well and pretty much irrelevant to what most people in China actually uh, want to read. And so, you know, it's just one of those things you look at across the board. Um, and what I mean, what 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 service? that Apple provides right now is actually useful. I mean, like if you want, I mean, no one uses maps, um, either, yeah. either a, a Baidu or, or, um, a map in Chinese is called uh, Galdu. my, my preference. Um, I mean, Apple actually, or in, in English it's, um, auto Um, and actually that's auto Navi is, uh, Apple's partner for maps here in China anyway. Um, but I mean, I mean, what, what services are there that you can use in China? Well, there's one, and that's the app store. Okay. <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> because yeah, they, I mean, they they have a corner on that market. Right. I mean, they, they, they you have to use the app store, right? So uh, there's no choice uh, if you're on a, if you're using an Apple device. Um, well, uh, well, <clears throat> actually, there is a choice now, and it, that, that choice is mini programs. Um, but <laughs> but that's another story, I think. Um, but um, yeah, the, the app store in China is is um, is a is a bright spot, I guess you could say. Um, certainly, the the revenue that's running through there, the indicators that we can get, the, the data that we can get, seems to say that it's it's, it's doing quite well. Um, what we worked out was that actually in China for the app store, the app store uh, revenue, it's um, according to Appani, it's something like ninety five percent of it is games. Mm. Um, and that's quite interesting. That's quite different from the rest of the world. The rest of the world, it, it definitely is uh, games as well are leading the market, but it's more something like 75%. Yeah. So in China, it's heavily weighted towards games uh, in terms of revenue for, that they're generating from the App Store. And of course, who dominates games? Um, well, that's Tencent. Yeah. And um, so Tencent, we worked out, um, we feel it's, it, Tencent is responsible for approximately half um, of all revenue coming through the App Store is from Tencent products, um, most, mostly their games. And um, Tencent is now, you know, very clearly um, in a sort of situation where they're conflicting with the App Store with what they're doing on WeChat. And Apple is in a very awkward situation where um, they're, for all the reasons we've been discussing so far, in a what is a fairly weak position in China. And then the company that is generating the most revenue for them uh, on, their, on their services is now um, undercutting them, uh, moving into uh, doing a, a, an initiative, this mini program initiative, which is obviously in the long run, I don't think now, but in the long run, um, a potentially a threat to their one bright spot in terms of services, which yeah. is the app store. Yeah. And, it, and it, it's amazing. I mean, like when I first heard about, um, mini programs, um, you know, I was a bit skeptical about, um, how, and to what degree they would actually be a threat to, to Apple. But, um, it's very clear that uh, WeChat and, and Tencent are very serious uh, about these mini programs. Um, you know, I think that you did uh, a blog post uh, a while back about um, you know their 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 future strategy in terms of um, augmented reality and 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 uh, QR codes, um, which if 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 it actually comes to fruition, will be 
a radical shift in the way that we interact uh, with with the the outside world. Um, and again, as we mentioned in a previous episode, you know, the mini programs are WeChat's strategy to close that loop uh, from you know from online to offline, and now from off offline to to online. I want to kind of bring it bring it back to 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 Apple. I mean, so if we're looking at them, you know, we've already, already talked a little bit about them versus uh, WeChat. But I mean, like, so this is this is the big question: is you know, are they going to be able to implement an effective China strategy? You know, as I said before, Huawei they have the opposite problem, where they're they they are optimizing for the China user um, and not doing so well in, in the West in particular, whereas Apple is optimizing for the Western user or, or for the quote unquote global user and not doing so well in, in China. So, I mean, Matt, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts? I mean, can they, can they pivot in terms of their China strategy? Is it possible for them to do that? I think these local players can move extremely fast. And um, we can see that from the, from the data um, that they can, they can pivot fast. Um, my uh, expectation is that they will the the Chinese players will look to go for the less mature markets globally in terms of their expansion plans. Um, the Chinese, yeah, so for example, Huawei and Oppo, you know, these guys are looking to do to take an increasing share in China, um, where they have the home market advantage, and then they're also looking at places like India, um, Southeast Asia. They're not really expecting, I believe, to get any sort of decent market share in Europe or this or North America, these sort of mature markets. Um, however, in two years time, that it could be quite a different picture. We could see them, um, you know, starting to starting to uh, make moves in those markets. Um, but we'll have to see. And that makes a lot more sense. You know, there's, there's, there's much more low hanging fruit. In, in those other markets, especially India, I think, right? There's just huge numbers there as well. Um, and, and localizing for those markets is also something that uh, it will be a challenge for all of these players. Um, but certainly Southeast Asia, you know, there's, there's a sort of cultural, there's a lot of you know, ethnic Chinese in Southeast Asia, for example. And culturally, there, there, are, there are some similarities, I think, with China. So um, they should they should be easier markets for them to attack rather than um, rather than the states. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, in general, like I, I have to say, because I think that there there have been quite a few companies um, that have tried to uh, uh, you know American companies or, or um, international technology companies that have tried to. Um, enter and succeed in the China market, and for I mean, up until recently, it, it to me at least it did seem that Apple was going to buck this trend um, because historically, you know, you see these um, international companies come in. Um, uh, Groupon is a great example. Um, Uber um, a bit a bit more recently, um, even yeah. before that, you know, um, eBay um, currently a- currently Amazon um, they are trying to pick up steam here in China, and perhaps they might actually be the ones to buck the trend. Um, but historically, you know, international technology companies have not done well in China uh, for for different reasons. I mean, you, you you look at each case, and there's there's a slightly different reason in each case. Um, but it did seem that Apple would um, just, I think, you know, by virtue of the the value of the product in and of itself, you know. And again, I'm I'm invested in the in the, in the Apple ecosystem, so um, perhaps my perspective is a bit skewed here. Um, but I thought, you know, the inertia of the product, the value of the product, um, and and Apple as a as a as a as a very strong company would kind of use that to, to keep expanding and to and to, and to keep um, growing um, in China, but it, it seems that you know unless they make some pretty big shifts, it's just not really gonna really gonna happen for them here. Um, yeah, uh, is I totally agree. I mean, but then when you, when you have to look at you know China's a they're moving into a dragon's den when you're in China. It's 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 uh, it's the most cutthroat, fast moving um, market around um, and uh, what what Apple I think we, we said it before Apple is um, 
it's got the problem that everyone has if you're a big global company is that you're going to have to tailor make a very different product for this market and empower your local team to do that and most big organizations are not willing to do that and um, and that's the core problem Exactly. Exactly. And I think I think there's 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 been lots of problems with international companies, multinationals trying to do that with their China team um, and having a lot of problems. And there, there have been there have been some some successes, but usually the successes are around marketing the products rather than creating the products themselves. Um, I think in general, a lot of the multinationals, they, they're very cognizant of the fact that they need local marketing teams. Um, to sell their products, but in terms of actual product design and creation, um, I mean the the differences in culture, uh, the difference is in in uh, communication styles. You know, the number of times that I've heard um, Westerners and Chinese people complaining about um, maybe not well, well there have been definitely some very strong complaints, um, but also just talking about how difficult it is and how do you maintain trust in that type of atmosphere where communication is a fundamental problem. Even if both sides are acting in good faith, um, communicating about intentions, communicating about, uh, you know, reasons for decisions um, is, is, is very, very difficult. Um, and so it's hard, it's very hard for me to imagine Apple doing that. And so not just because of the communication problems, but just because how obsessed they are with um, unity in, in terms of their products, because, you know, they're not, it's hard for me to imagine them saying, okay, so we're going to have an iPhone for, you know, the U.S. and then an iPhone for China. Um, that doesn't seem to make sense in terms of in terms of their sure. product strategy. But that's what they should have done. <laughs> right. Going back, right, iPhone, uh, Apple, if they'd done that, if they'd said, okay, we're going to make a uh, product and an ecosystem just for China and put significant resources into that, and if they'd made that, it's too late now, right, it's too late. But if they'd made that decision uh, in, you know, uh, five years ago, um, then yeah, I think they would be in a much, much stronger position in, in China. Now, obviously, they're a global company, China's just one market, but um, it's, a, it's, it's rapidly becoming the most important market. Um, yeah, so this is the quote from, from App Annie in a recent report, uh, a forecast. Um, strong purchasing power and cultural factors will help China account for a staggering 41% of mobile app store, both iOS and Android consumer spend by 2021. Wow. Yeah, so this is, I think this is what um, a lot of people don't get is that, you know, China's just one country, obviously, and there's a lot of people in China, but you know, obviously it's just one country and one part of the world. But the market here is moving so fast and there is such a scale um, that actually when you summon up to the rest of the world, it's, it, packs, it packs a punch way above its weight, way above its weight, because people here are spending a lot more online and online is moving so much faster. So, um, you know, 41% of all app store uh, spend um, in, in, in just uh, like three, uh, four years time is what App Annie is, is, is predicting. So if you have the Chinese market, if you have it on lockdown, like Tencent does, for example, now you've got 41% of all app store spend globally on lockdown. You don't need anything else. Right? So a company, a company like Tencent, if they just dominate China or Alibaba, if they dominate China, they're already in a position to, to compete with Apple because China is almost half of everything globally, or it will be in five years time. That's what people don't get, <laughs> right? That's, that's the reason why uh, these Chinese companies don't, a lot of them, they, they, put, they put so much effort into the Chinese market and people say, well, you know, they're not expanding globally. Not yet, but they don't need to. They need to, you, this market, this, this Chinese market is gonna eventually be almost half of everything. So you only need China to compete with Apple, even though Apple's global. Well, Matt, you just blew my mind. You just absolutely blew my mind. Um, and it's, on the one hand, not surprising, but on the other hand, uh, very, very staggering. And I think that's probably where we should end, because I have nothing else that I could possibly say at this point. 
when you, and we'll and we'll and we'll make sure to include include the link to that to that app any report um, in in the show notes. But um, but yeah, so that's 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 all we have for this week. And I say all we have, but there was a lot of stuff um, in in this in this episode. If you've gotten this far, um, thank you so much for taking the time to to listen um, to this episode. And if you enjoyed this episode, uh, please, um, we would really appreciate it if you took the time to uh, leave us a review on on iTunes. Um, We'll have a, a link to a short tutorial on, on, on how to do that. It's not as easy as you would think. Thank you very much, Apple. Um, and we will talk to you next week.